You are watching Cold Fusion TV. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. In the last video, which was on the topic of a brief history of the internet, I talked about how the future of the internet was under threat by Article 13, and a lot of people wanted to know more about the new laws being proposed by the EU. So here we are. So what is Article 13? It's part of the European Copyright Directive that was passed in September of 2018. Essentially, it's designed to update existing copyright laws in Europe, but as you'll see, if it stays as written, it will affect the whole world. So let's look at how copyright works now and how this will change. The way copyright works on the internet today is as follows. Currently, fair use laws allow for the use of copyrighted content. This includes use for criticism, educational use, research and news reporting. If something is uploaded illegally outside of fair use, then it's up to the producers of the copyrighted music or videos to go after whoever's illegally uploading the content. With Article 13, the European version of fair use is largely thrown out the window, and even more devastating, and this is the important part, the responsibility of chasing up illegal content will shift onto the major platforms themselves. Briefly put, Article 13 places responsibility on websites such as YouTube, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to make sure that copyrighted material isn't illegally uploaded. If they're found to be hosting such content, they'll be slapped with a fine for every instance of this happening. And this results in massive unintended consequences. All websites that allow user uploaded content aren't going to want to take the risk of being sued under Article 13. They're going to only allow content that they can be 100% sure isn't going to result in them getting sued. The chances are, regular user uploaded content isn't going to make the cut, and only the biggest companies will be guaranteed to upload legally under Article 13. So I understand that copyright protection is important, but the way it is stated in Article 13 is very poorly defined. An earlier version of the law stated that there should be a use of, quote, proportionate content recognition technologies, end quote. This would be similar to YouTube's current AI copyright recognition, and if the law stayed that way, that would be okay. But in the new version of the proposal that was passed in September, vested interests lobbied to make the language increasingly vague. Now it reads that companies have to, quote, cooperate in good faith when dealing with copyrighted content. The EU's definition of good faith could mean anything. For example, all content that could be interpreted as copyrighted material might not be used in good faith. This is just setting the system up prime for abuse. Every frame of video, every drawing, every sound, every photo will be under heavy scrutiny. Even simple things as small as logos are all copyrighted material and they're not going to be allowed. Such a broad definition ends up making the law potentially extremely strict. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki stated that Article 13, quote, poses a threat to creators' livelihoods and all of our ability to upload videos to share our voices with the world. The proposal could force platforms like YouTube to allow only content from a small, large number of companies. It will be too risky for platforms to host content from smaller original content creators because the platforms will now be directly liable for that content, end quote. So here's more about what YouTube themselves had to say on the topic. As currently written by the European Parliament, Article 13 could mean that YouTube is forced to block millions of existing and new videos in the EU. Many types of videos could be blocked. Those include educational videos, lots of official music videos, fan music covers, and mashups, parodies, and more. The proposed version would eliminate our existing notice and takedown system. This would make platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, SoundCloud, Dailymotion, Reddit, and Snapchat liable at the moment of upload for any copyright infringement in uploads from users, creators, and artists. Platforms including YouTube would be forced to block the majority of uploads given the uncertainty and complexity of copyright ownership. It's clear that this is a bad idea, but what about those outside of Europe? Will they be affected? The answer is probably yes. Film theory puts it best. 
And when different countries have different laws, companies usually cater to the least common denominator. Rather than having different policies for users in different countries, companies will just usually target the strictest set of rules and comply with those, then apply that set of rules to everybody. For a recent example of this, earlier this year, you probably got a flood of emails from Facebook, Google, Reddit, and pretty much every website under the sun notifying you, hey, we've updated our privacy policy, click that you accept it. Well, the fact that you got all these emails around the same time wasn't a coincidence. All of these companies were updating their privacy policy to comply with GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation passed in May by, you guessed it, the European Union. These sorts of privacy and copyright changes affect all users. So Article 13 might just be a case of old people not knowing how the internet works, or it could be a case of a staggering amount of corruption. Either way, we all lose. Although Article 13 has already been passed, the good news is that the law's wording hasn't been finalised, so there's still a chance to turn things around. And here's what you can do. If you're in Europe, contact your MEPs via Twitter or any other means, and let them know what they're actually voting for here. If you're outside of Europe, you can sign a number of online petitions to make your voice heard. I'll leave some links below. If you want more information, you can head over to saveyourinternet.eu. Okay, so that just about wraps up Article 13, but there's some other things I wanted to talk about. So for the second part of this video, I just wanted to clear the air. I usually avoid getting political as it's usually not of any benefit, and I'm giving you an opportunity to leave the video now if you don't want to hear a discussion about the EU. Okay, so for those of you still watching, the following is strictly for the purpose of elaborating on what I said in the last video. I'm just responding to some of the reactions I had. So, in the last video, I mentioned that the EU has grown out of control while no one seemed to notice, and a lot of people got really upset about that. I know it was strong wording, but there is some basis to that. The EU has definitely seen a major case of scope creep. So the EU was established to stop a future European war and started off as the free trade of coal and steel within Europe in the 1950s and then expanded to include free travel in 1992. So don't get me wrong, I can see that these intentions were originally great ideas, but after the Lisbon Treaty in 2007, we started to see a consolidation of power and now the organisation is even calling for an EU army and we'll get to that in a second. But aside from this, I've also noticed some concerning rhetoric. I first noticed some of the strange language regarding the need for more power when I was following the Greek economic crisis in 2011 and came across this clip. And that is the real problem, colleagues. Why there is such a problem in this crisis? Because member states are reluctant to transfer new sovereignty and powers to the European Union. And we all know that the only way out of this crisis is a new transfer of powers to the European Union and to the European institutions. This was in reference to the lack of economic collaboration between member states for the Greek bailout, and that's definitely fair enough. But the language used here suggests that the only solution is more EU power, not simply more discussion and cooperation. And that stuck with me. And by the way, according to insiders like Jim Rickards, who was the financial intelligence analyst for the US government and was consulted on the issue, these economic problems in Europe were caused by a lack of consolidation of debt by the EU member states during the creation of the euro currency. So logically, I can't see how more power to the EU is the best and most efficient way of solving this issue. It seems like an unnecessary bid for power. Anyway, back to the scope creep and the EU army. In the previous video when I was saying that the EU was out of control, I was going to play a clip of the leader of the European Union stating a need for an EU army. If things go Jean-Claude Juncker's way, this will be the future of European defence. In an interview, the president of the EU Commission called for a European army. I ended up removing this clip from the final edit because I felt that it detracted from the main story. So the questions I have is what populations of the EU member states voted for such an army? It doesn't seem like a good sign. Full disclaimer, I'm definitely no expert in this area, but all I can do is logically look at the situation. There are claims that the EU army will reduce costs, which I understand, but it seems to me that this will only lead to more geopolitical escalation. There's even talk of this EU army defending against China, Russia, and the United States, a supposed ally. Nous nous devons nous protéger à l'égard de la Chine, de la Russie et même des États-Unis d'Amérique. Protégera pas les Européens si on ne décide pas d'avoir une vraie armée européenne. Mm. What does this have to do with the original goals of free trade and travel within Europe? And besides, when has centralised power ever led to anything good in history? Statistically, there's more risk of things going wrong when you consolidate power. Just as an example, 
If the decision makers at the European Union end up majorly corrupted by monetary interests, which often happens, but still has unified military power, what then? Will we have yet another bully on the world stage? So all of that thinking was contained in the couple of sentences I said in the last video. Of course, this is just an opinion and I'm just looking at the situation logically. You're most welcome to disagree and I actually want to hear opposing sides of you in the comment section. Again, free travel and trade is great and so are other things like the encryption protection laws, but I'm not so convinced on the growing consolidation of power. Oh, and in the previous video, I stated that the leaders were unelected and this definitely was an incorrect statement. There is definitely an election process. What I meant by that was that the correlation between the will of the people in the EU member states and the laws that they receive from the EU seems to be weak. So yeah, using the term unelected wasn't right. Just wanted to set that one straight. Anyway, if you made it this far without being mad, thank you. You're a person of great understanding. I'm looking forward to reading your comments on opposing views. All right, so that's it. No more political stuff and we'll get back to tech stuff in the next video. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you again in the next video. Cheers guys. Have a good one.